This is the second set of notes on biotechnology. This time we're going to be talking about DNA analysis and electrophoresis. So DNA profiling is an analyzing the DNA fragments to determine whether they came from the same individual. We're going to be using the um, restriction enzymes we talked about in the last in the last note set to cut the DNA into pieces, and then we're going to compare various samples together. And what we're doing is really comparing um, genetic markers from non-coding regions of the DNA rather than the parts that code for proteins. Part of this involves amplifying or copying of the markers for analysis by a process called PCR, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. So here's, here's a, just an example of what would happen if you had, let's say, uh, blood from a crime scene and you had two suspects, you had no idea which one it was. You could isolate DNA from all three of those from the crime scene and also from the two suspects. You can amplify those, those uh, markers of the, in the DNA and then you can compare it by running an electrophoresis gel which lets you see that in this case you can see that the banding pattern of the crime scene DNA matches up with the banding pattern of suspect 2 which probably means this blood was from this suspect. So we're, how do we amplify those samples? We do it by means of a process called polymerase chain reaction, or, or PCR. This takes a specific segment of DNA and amplifies it or multiplies it. it. What it does is it runs through several cycles and it doubles the amount of DNA each time you pass through the cycle. And it allows you to take a very small sample, which you sometimes have just from a, from a crime scene evidence or whatever, and uh, amplify it into a much larger sample that you can get um, a faster results from. And it allows for pretty quick results. Now I realize it's not as fast as it shows on TV. It takes longer than that. But it still uh, allows it to happen pretty quickly. So here's the process that there's, this shows one cycle of PCR. You're going to take this target sequence of DNA that you're looking at. You're going to separate, you're going to heat it so that it separates the two DNA strands from each other. And then you put some primers in, in with mix the, these DNA primers in there. And they're going to bond with the ends of this target sequence that you're looking at. And then you've got DNA polymerase enzyme. It will add the nucleotides in place. And so you end up with here's primer and new DA, DNA that's been formed. And the second cycle will make four molecules of DNA from the first two. And the third cycle will yield eight and so forth. Every time you run a cycle of it, which takes anywhere from 20 minutes to a couple of hours, depending on what you're copying. Uh, every time you run the cycle, it's going to double the amount of DNA that you have, which allows you, in a pretty short amount of time, to get a lot of DNA where you had very little to begin with. Um, we use this oftentimes when we're doing a gel electrophoresis, which is what, what is going to sort the DNA molecules by size. Um, the DNA samples are placed at one end of the gel. The gel is a, a porous material that's kind of jelly-like, sort of like agar, but not exactly. It's called agarose. And you put the samples in wells or little um, notches in one end of the gel. And then you put it in a tank that, that you apply some current to, electrical current. The DNA molecules have um, negatively charged phosphate groups on them. And so they're going to be repelled by the negative end of the um, a negative electrode of the tank and attracted to the positive end. So when you put the current through there, the DNA will flow from the negative to the positive. The DNA molecule pieces that are shorter are going to move through the gel faster and they're going to travel farther in the amount of time that you let the, that the, you let the electricity run. The larger ones will get stuck in the gel and not be able to travel as far or as quickly. And so what you're going to end up with after the period of time that you run the gel, you're going to end up with the fragments showing up as bands on the gel. Each of those bands is a collection of DNA molecules of the same length, and that makes the fingerprint, the DNA fingerprint that, we, that you see pictures of on TV a lot of times. This just gives you, this diagram shows you what we have. We have the gel here, we have the wells where we put the samples. The electric, electricity is applied here from positive to, from negative to positive. Electrons, remember, are negative. They're going to flow from the negative electrode to the positive one because they're attracted to the opposite charge. As the, as the electricity flows, it's going to push those DNA fragments through the gel. And the shorter, faster molecules are going to run down closer to the positive pole. The longer, slower ones are going to stay closer to the um, negative pole. And you're going to end up with a pattern, a banding pattern, that shows you the DNA profile that you're looking at here. 
Here's a picture of one. This, this is a one that they use uh, ultraviolet light to show. There are, a lot of, there are different ways to treat the gels to make the uh, bands visible. Sometimes it involves dyeing something, and sometimes it involves using a, um, a marker that will show up in fluorescence like this one does. Now we use that for DNA profiling, which is used for a lot of different things. Of course, we often see it talked about on TV as, as being used to determine guilt or innocence in a crime. Another really common use of it is to settle questions of paternity. My uh, husband used to be a child support enforcement judge, and he routinely ordered DNA tests when someone wasn't when um, someone wasn't sure who the father of the baby was, or the guy wasn't willing to admit that he was the father. Um, and it's, it's used very often for things like that. You can also use it to identify victims of accidents. If you're not sure who the people are that were in the accident, then you can identify who they are uh, if you have some suspicion of who they might be related to. And then you can also use it to probe origins of non-human materials, like where, you know, if it, is this an animal or is it a plant or is it bacterial or whatever. And it's also used a lot in uh, genomic studies, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, here are some examples of DNA folk profiles or fingerprints. You can see here, this is another one of those fluorescing ones. Here we have one that's printed on paper that you can see the lines, the bands that match up here. Some of them have more bands than others, depending on what technique is used. Here's one that, that lets you look at Johnny and see whether his parents were, we know Lois Lane was his mother, obviously, but was his dad Superman or Batman? And you probably can tell by looking at the gels who the daddy is. And we'll talk about that in class. Uh, another structure, another uh, technique that's used is RFLP, or restriction fragment length polymorphism. This is the change in the length of the, of the restriction fragments because of the differences that make those rest restriction sites um, dif um, different. And it's going to produce DNA fragments again by those restriction enzymes like we talked about with the with the plasmid, and then you're going to sort the fragments out by electrophoresis like we did for the DNA profile. Here we have several of them like this, and you can see that as the, as the electricity passes through the gel and spreads out these, you can compare the differences in the, in the polymorphisms that are present there. This is a lot of what Ms. Billingsley was doing with the tiger DNA that she was studying in her, in her non-teaching job. Um, this she sometimes talked to you about uh, working on the tiger DNA, and this is the kind of thing that she was doing there to compare the different uh, species of tigers to see the similarities and differences between them. Um, and the, the last topic in this particular set of notes is about genomics. This is the study of whole genomes of organisms. This is a new way that we have of examining evolutionary relationships. Um, this includes things like the Human Genome Project. And here are some things that have been learned from that. This is one, this is just a few of the many, many hundreds of things that have been learned from the Human Genome Project, where they analyze the entire human genome. First of all, humans and chimpanzees differ only a very small amount in base substitutions and a little bit more in insertions and deletions of larger sequences. They're very, very similar, 98.8% uh, the same. And uh, Humans, evolve, when they began evolving, evolved, they sometimes went through periods of rapid evolution, and some of those periods included um, the mutations that produce genes for defense against malaria and tuberculosis, genes for brain size, and a gene involved with speech and vocalization. One of the things that you need to realize about differences in DNA and, and all the differences that occur is that all differences originated, originally originated from mutations. Some mutations come, sometimes are bad, but sometimes they're good because they lead to things like defense against malaria or being able to talk. This concludes the second set of notes for biotechnology. We, again, we're going to be completing some activities in class um, along this line and learning some more things about it between now and the EOC, and then we will also do some more things after the EOC is over with.